Few popular games have attracted as much speculation, controversy, and condemnation as the Ouija board. While to some, this simple board covered in letters is little more than a harmless toy, to others it is a dangerous tool of the occult, responsible for untold cases of corruption, demonic possessions, and madness. But what is the truth? Where did this iconic divination tool come from, and how does it work? Well, dim the lights, call upon the great beyond, and let's find out, shall we? Though divination, the art of contacting the gods or the spirit realm to predict the future, is as old as human history, the Ouija board is a much more recent development, tracing its origins to the spiritualist movement of the mid-19th century. In March of 1848, two teenage sisters, Margaret and Kate Fox, of Hydesville, New York, claimed to be able to communicate with spirits via faint rapping sounds heard in response to tapping or snapping their fingers. Connecting these rappings with the letters of the alphabet, the Fox sisters identified the spirit as belonging to one Charles B. Rosna, a traveling peddler who had been murdered by the house's previous owner and hidden in the cellar. While a search of the cellar revealed no human remains, Margaret and Kate's older sister, Leah, recognized the commercial potential of the girl's abilities and became their manager, naturally financed by showman P.T. Barnum. Their act became a sensation, kickstarting a worldwide craze of psychic performances and seances. This mania was further fueled by the mass slaughter of the American Civil War, as millions of grieving Americans flocked to spiritualist mediums in the hopes of contacting their departed loved ones. One prominent adherent of the time was Mary Todd Lincoln, wife of President Abraham Lincoln, who began holding seances at the White House following the death of her son William of typhoid fever in 1862. While in 1888 the Fox sisters admitted that their abilities were a complete fraud, they had produced the wrappings themselves by clicking their toe joints, it was was already too late. Spiritualism had taken the world by storm, gaining such illustrious adherents as Emperor Napoleon III, H.G. Wells, T.E. Lawrence, and even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes. Spiritualist mediums used a variety of methods and tools to communicate with the spirit realm. Seances were typically conducted in a darkened room, with the medium and participants arranged in a circle. The medium would then enter a trance-like state in which they would channel messages from the great beyond. Sometimes, like with the Fox sisters, spirits would communicate through rapping noises, which the medium or an assistant would translate, while other times the spirits spoke directly through the medium's voice, with the messages often being called out one letter at a time, presumably so the ghosts could show off their spelling abilities. In extreme cases, the spirits would manifest more dramatic phenomenon, such as levitating the seance's table, making trumpets and other instruments to play on their own, or causing a strange gelatinous substance called ectoplasm to emanate from the medium's body. Another common communication method used by mediums was psychography or automatic writing, whereupon spirits would act through a medium or even directly through a writing instrument to spell out messages. At its simplest, automatic writing involved the medium holding a pen or pencil as they slipped into a trance, with the spirits guiding their hand to write out messages. Another variation involved placing a stick of chalk between two slates and binding the slates together, then waiting for the magic to happen as things rubbed around in there. When the seance was finished, the slates were pulled apart to reveal the message in white within. High school boys were masters of this one. Some practitioners, however, found this method overly laborious and sought more efficient tools with which to communicate with spirits. In 1853, French spiritualist leader Alanic Kardec described the creation of such a tool. During a seance held on June 10th of that year, one participant attached a pencil to a small upturned basket and invited the other guests to lay their hands on it. Together, the participants acted collectively to write out messages from the spirits. This crude device soon evolved into the planche, French for little board, a small platform designed to glide across a table and hold a pencil or other writing instrument. Use of the planche quickly spread across Europe and to North America, with a cottage industry springing up overnight to feed the demand for the devices. Planches were manufactured in all shapes and sizes, with American versions usually being shield or heart-shaped, and from all sorts of materials, including wood, hard rubber, or glass. While early planches were designed to write out messages directly on paper, paper, spiritualists soon developed a simpler version that was used atop a board inscribed with letters and words. These so-called talking boards were first recorded being used in spiritualist camps in Ohio in 1886. Around this time, a trio of Baltimore businessmen named Elijah Bond, Ernest Raish, and Charles Kennard decided that the spiritualist talking board might make a popular parlor game. And so it was that on May 28, 1890, they took out a patent for their own version. 
This new talking board featured a layout distinctive from earlier versions, with the 26 letters of the alphabet laid out in two arcs, the numbers 0 through 9 in a straight line below, and the words yes, no, and goodbye at the bottom and top corners of the board. In later versions, hello and other words or symbols were sometimes added as well. Completing the board was a triangular wooden planche with a hole in the middle that players could use to spell out messages. In 1891, Charles Kennard, owner of the Kennard Novelty Company, began manufacturing and selling the board under the trade name Ouija, with advertisements proclaiming the new product as Ouija, the magic game, remarkable, interesting, and mystifying game, great mirth-making game for parties, apparently answers questions concerning past, present, and future. There are several hypotheses as to where the name Ouija came from. Charles Kennard claimed that the game received the name in April of 1890 during a seance held at a boarding house at 529 North Charles Street in Baltimore, attended by Kennard, Elijah Bond, and Bond's sister-in-law, a medium named Helen Peters. During the seance, Peters asked the board what it wanted to be named, to which the attending spirit replied, O-U-I-J-A, claiming it was an ancient Egyptian word meaning good luck. Moments later, a perturbed Peters reached to her neck and pulled out a chain, at the end of which was a locket containing the image of a woman and the signature Ouija. Kenner asked Peters if she had been thinking about the locket during the seance. Peters said no, and the name stuck. While no such word as Ouija exists in the ancient Egyptian language, at least one element of Kennard's account is plausible. The woman in Peter's locket was most likely one Marie-Louise Ramey, a popular French writer of romance and adventure novels who went by the pen name Ouida. By the 1890s, Ramey's image and signature had become a popular talisman for educated, forward-thinking women like Helen Peters. It is thus likely that Kennard simply misread Ouida and Ouija and an iconic brand name was born. Whatever the case, in 1892, Kennard lost control of his company, which was taken over by his former foreman and furniture polisher, William Fold. Fold immediately proceeded to rewrite the history of the Ouija board, claiming that he himself had invented it and that its name was the combination of the words oui and je, French and German, for yes. Under Fold's leadership, Ouija boards sold in steadily greater numbers, reaching peak popularity in the 1920s. There were two main reasons for this surge. The first was the massive resurgence of spiritualism triggered by the Great War, which, like the Civil War, left millions grieving and desperate to make contact with departed husbands, brothers, and sons. The second was the freewheeling, anything-goes culture of the Jazz Age, which encouraged young people to seek out all sorts of newfangled fads and thrills, including casually dabbling in the occult. Indeed, by this time, the game had become so normal and inoffensive that in May of 1920, artist Norman Rockwell, patron saint of wholesome Americana, depicted a couple using the Ouija board on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Ouija boards continued to sell well through the Great Depression and beyond, with Fold opening additional factories to keep up with demand. In 1944, a single New York department store sold over 5,000 sets, while in 1967, after Fold sold the rights to the game to Parker Brothers, over 2 million Ouija boards were sold, beating out even perennial bestseller Monopoly, which, by the way, most people play wrong, which makes the game suck, as we recently covered over on our sister channel, Fat Quickie. But in any event, today, a Ouija is a trademark of Hasbro Inc., which continues to manufacture talking boards in all sorts of shapes, sizes, colors, and themes, including a glow-in-the-dark edition perfect for late-night seances. But not everyone sees the Ouija board as harmless fun. From the very beginning, the talking board was roundly condemned by many Christian denominations, who saw the game as a dangerous tool of the occult. Many of these critics have pointed to Deuteronomy 18.10-12 through 12 in the Bible, which states, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Similarly, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is explicit in its prohibition of divination. All forms of divination are to be rejected. Recourse to Satan or demons, conjuring up the dead, or other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future. Religious opposition to Ouija boards was further fueled by purported cases of demonic possession brought about by the game. The most famous of these involved a 14-year-old Maryland boy named Ronald Hunkeller, who allegedly became possessed in 1949 after using a Ouija board. Hunkeller underwent a month-long exorcism by Jesuit priest Father William Bowden, an event which later formed the 
the basis of author William Peter Blatty's 1971 novel The Exorcist and its infamous 1973 film adaptation. Ouija boards have also been blamed for driving players insane. In her 1971 memoirs, Confession of a Psychic, parapsychologist Susie Smith claimed that using a Ouija board caused her to become mentally disturbed, while in his 1924 book, 30 Years Among the Dead, psychologist Dr. Carl Wicklin wrote that the cases of several persons whose seemingly harmless experiences with automatic writing and the Ouija board resulted in such wild insanity that commitment to asylums was necessitated. Religious opposition to Ouija boards persists to this day, with many organizations, including the Dutch Reformed Churches, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, and Human Life International issuing strict prohibitions on its members using the boards. In 2001, a church in Alamogordo, New Mexico carried out a mass burning of Ouija boards, as well as Harry Potter books, as symbols of witchcraft. While in 2010, Human Life International spokesman Stephen Fellen decried Hasbro's launch of a pink Ouija board for girls, stating, There's a spiritual reality to it, and Hasbro is treating it as if it's just a game. It's not Monopoly, it really is a dangerous spiritual game, and for Hasbro to treat it as just another game is quite dishonest. While whether Ouija boards can actually cause demonic possession or insanity in its players, similar to Monopoly, is a question science may never answer. The game presents at least one tantalizing graphic graspable mystery. How is it able to spell out such coherent answers when no single participant can control the planchet? Are the players somehow unconsciously communicating with one another and coordinating their movements, or is some other force entirely at play? Interestingly, investigations into this phenomenon predate the introduction of planchets and talking boards as spiritual tools. For instance, in 1853, English physicist Michael Faraday, most famous for discovering electromagnetism, conducted a series of clever experiments to determine whether the phenomenon of table movement during seances was caused by the participants or some other force. In his first experiment, Faraday fixed a number of cardboard sheets to a table using a sticky putty made of wax and turpentine, which was formulated to be strong enough to offer significant resistance to movement, but soft enough to remain in place once moved. Faraday then drew pencil lines on the table to mark the initial position of each cardboard sheet and instructed participants to place their hands on the sheet while conducting a seance. Per Faraday's logic, if it was some outside force and not the participants who moved the table, then the participants' hands would lag behind the table, causing the cardboard sheets to move in the opposite direction of the table. If, on the other hand, it was the participants who were moving the table, then the sheets would move in the same direction as the table. In every case, the sheets moved in the same direction as the table. In a follow-up experiment, Faraday sandwiched a set of glass rollers between two plates, bound the plates together with rubber bands, and passed a vertical haystock through a hole in both plates, such that if a participant moved their hands even slightly, the angle of the haystock would change. When participants were challenged to keep the haystock perfectly vertical throughout the seance, all movement of the table suddenly ceased, proving that it was the participants who were moving the table and not the other way around. Faraday's experiments were an early demonstration of a phenomenon known as automatism, coined the year before by physician William Benjamin Carpenter. Known today as the ideomotor effect, automatism refers to carrying out a motion or task without being aware of doing so. In the case of the Ouija board, professor of neurology Terence Hines explains in his 2003 book Pseudoscience and the Paranormal, the planche is guided by unconscious muscular exertions like those responsible for table movement. In both cases, the illusion that the object table or planche is moving under its own control is often extremely powerful and sufficient to convince many people that spirits are truly at work. The unconscious muscle movements responsible for the moving tables and Ouija board phenomena seen at seances are examples of a class of the phenomena due to what psychologists call a disassociative state. A disassociative state is one in which consciousness is somehow divided or cut off from some aspect of the individual's normal cognitive motor or sensory functions. Ideal motor phenomena can be surprisingly powerful and led to some truly bizarre effects, as demonstrated by a series of experiments carried out by professor and psychologist Dr. Ron Rensick, researcher Helena Guchow, and computer engineer professor Dr. Sidney Fells at the University of British Columbia in 2021. In a move that definitely does not foreshadow a future descent into the occult-themed supervillainy, the team constructed a Ouija-playing robot which experimental subjects were told was controlled by a human player in another room. 
In reality, there was no other player and the robot was designed to amplify the motions of the lone subject. Subjects were then set at the Ouija board to answer a series of yes or no trivia questions. The results were astonishing. When subjects were asked to answer the question verbally, they got the answers right only 50% of the time. But when they used the Ouija board, their accuracy jumped to 65%. In a follow-up experiment, subjects started off playing with another participant, but some point during the experiment, the subject was blindfolded and the other player, actually a confederate of the researchers, removed their hands from the planchet. Yet despite being the only ones actually moving the planchet, subjects still answered questions with 15% more accuracy using the Ouija board than without. These results suggest that the subconscious mind is a lot more knowledgeable than we previously thought, as Dr. Fells later explained. You do better with the Ouija on questions that you really don't think you know, but actually something inside you does know and the Ouija can help you answer above chance. Now that we have some hypothesis in terms of what's going on here, accessing knowledge and cognitive abilities that you don't have conscious awareness of, the Ouija board would be an instrument to actually get at that. Now we can start using it to ask other types of questions. In the end, while the Ouija board may not be good for actually communicating with spirits, we here at Origin still find it invaluable for answering all the most important questions in life, like whether you're going to click here to learn all about the rather fascinating and gruesome origins of the chainsaw.